So um, we're going to talk about uh, the bicuspid aortic valve, how we calculate a reliable gradient, although after the last session of Girish, I'm not sure we can do anything accurately anymore, <laughs> except perhaps waffle. Uh, and uh, the differences between the sites of fusion that uh, Steve uh, already uh, uh, eloquently uh, brought to your attention, and what's important about quantitation of aortic regurgitation, what's new about afterload mismatch, and the future of echocardiographic assessment. Well, bicuspid valves, as uh, Steve said, uh, are associated with aortic coarctation. They're associated with aortic root dilatation and in dissection. And in fact, under the age of 40, the commonest cause of dissection is a bicuspid aortic valve. So it's very important. The other interesting thing about bicuspid aortic valve, not that even that it's so um, prevalent, but it's the second leading cause in the United States for cardiac surgery after coronary bypass. So it really is a substantial problem. And I've always worked with Julian Hoffman. I didn't re uh, read his paper, but he told me always that the incidence of uh, bicuspid aortic valve in the population is about uh, two per hundred, two to three in a hundred. So in this room, at least one of us probably has a bicuspid aortic valve, and as I've done my own echocardiogram, I know it's not me. <laughs> so it's got to be one of you. But uh, it's certainly a big problem, and of course, uh, the latest theory, um, I don't know where Steve's gone, he, here he comes back now, doesn't want to listen to what I've got to say. But um, the point is that I, don't, I believe that um, that the, the aortic root dilatation is related to the um, metalloproteinase uh, abnormalities. But if you look at uh, bicuspid valves or aortic stenosis in general, and you look at them on autopsy, there's almost always a localized swelling. So albeit that there really is a genetic mechanism, there is specifically an area where there is more trauma in the aorta, and I think the aorta responds to that in an abnormal way. And of course, then it's associated with other diseases, simply uh, put, okay? And uh, here's Bill Roberts' uh, statistics, uh, another man interested in aortic valve disease of 1 to 2%, uh, and it's more uh, prevalent in, in males, okay? Uh, now, then we know that there's specific uh, 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 genetic models for this, and the ENOS and NKX 2.5 and NOTCH1 signaling are important in this. And this fascinating study that came from Spain about bicuspid aortic valves. And uh, I'm going to talk about the study that we did as well. But it seemed that there was a different pattern of each kind. And what the Spanish study suggested was there's a genetic basis for the fusion as well. So that there's different genetic patterns on fusion between left-right and uh, right non-coronary fusion. It's a wonderful paper to read. Now, looking at the aorta, looking at a, a, a root dilatation, we can measure the, the root. What actually the annulus of the valve is is probably a rim, a thick rim of tissue, and we have to measure it at various places. And in this study by Hahn et al., you can see that um, how with the progressive time that um, the various parts of the aorta increase in size, with 3.3 being the uh, 2 plus Z score level for an aortic root in adults. Here's a cartoon on the MMP and what happens in the normal aortic root with ground substance that Steve uh, mentioned, and what happens in the bicuspid aortic valve. And you can see that the support tissue that is going to support the aortic wall is, uh, is, is markedly um, deficient uh, from this uh, MMP uh, release. Okay. Now, at the same time as Steve was doing his study, I had a young lady from England working with me whose name was Giovanna Ciotti. And uh, so I put both of these studies down because we didn't know what Steve was doing and, uh, and he obviously didn't know what we were doing until we both talked about it. But uh, we, we looked at the study and I've always thought of uh, looking at the aortic valve very much like a Mercedes Benz because that's frankly what most doctors see on their way to work in the morning is that little sign on the front of their car. But um, it's, there's nothing that could be further from the truth. So what we looked at in these patients is we looked at the sizes of the areas of the different cusps. And I think echocardiography 
is a nice technique for looking at this because you can look at a large number of patients without looking at the autopsies and get some idea of the cusp fusion. And here's a normal patient, which is, uh, uh, I turned uh, in, this, uh, in this way from above, the non-coronary, the left coronary here, uh, as we look at it echocardiographically, is on the other side, and the right coronary. And you can see that the areas of these cusps as a percentage of the total area is completely different, with the non-coronary usually being the biggest cusp and the left coronary cusp being usually the smallest cusp. So bicuspid valves. Well, we can see a normal tricuspid valve by both a surface echo and also by means of um, uh, transesophageal. Here's a bicuspid commissural cusp with, uh, with the left uh, right commissural fusion. And the way to look at this, to my mind, is to look at it in real time. Uh, we normally record these by means of a, uh, a, still f uh, a cine capture and then slow the speed down so that we can see the motion because sometimes the valve may look like a tricuspid valve in the closed position and the, the fusion is only partial and when it opens it's really a bicuspid valve. So I think looking at the valve with motion gives you an idea what you're doing. Now the first thing that interested me about this is we saw that in the normal aortic valve that um, the cusps were all of different sizes and um, that there's no cusp that ever made up 50%. But if you look at almost all of the bicuspid valves that we look at, you'll see that the non-fused valve occupies almost 50% of the diameter of the valve. And here's an echocardiogram, uh, I beg your pardon, an autopsy specimen that shows it's matched up for this uh, particular entity. Now, our, our findings for left-right fusion, there you go. You see, it looks like it might be a tricuspid valve when it's closed, but when it's open, it's clearly opening as a, 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 a bicuspid valve. And again, if you look at the non-coronary cusp, it's much larger than the normal non-coronary cusp. Now, right non-coronary leaflet fusion, uh, was here, we, we noticed certain differences between these, particularly with aortic root measurements. And I don't know why that is, but to certainly it seemed that when we had dilation of the aortic root uh, with the right non-fusion, it was usually more profound and diffuse than with the left-right fusion. And you can see that transesophageally as well. So what did our valve population look like? We had only 117 patients in our group, uh, there was impairment in 73% and no impairment in 27%. Uh, pure stenosis 32, mixed lesions 27, 11% were pure insufficiency and the rest of them were uncalculable. I don't know where the rest of the numbers landed up. And I mean everybody's got one and I think uh, you know this is uh, uh, very rare to find we had to go through the entire database and uh, found one patient where it looked like there was a fusion of the right, uh, uh, the left non-coronary cusp. And that's really the only example, so we took it out. And as I said, we me measured the dimensions of the various cusps, and you can see uh, the area of the non-fused coronary cusp was much greater in uh, bicuspid valves than its corresponding fellow in a non-fused cusp. So if it happened to be the left coronary cusp, it was much bigger than the normal left coronary cusp, and the same is true as if it was a non-coronary cusp. Okay, diseases uh, that we found in our population, obviously coarctation is the highest. Um, we only had 34% uh, of those cases. You'll see uh, how, how to calculate the statistics makes a difference as who's got what. VSD, subaortic stenosis, mitral valve, patent ductus, and then a straddling of all other kinds of diseases including, in fact, pulmonary stenosis, Epstein's mal uh, malformation, AV canal defects, and so on and so forth. I mentioned this the other day when we talked about calculating a, a velocity gradient, and we, we showed in the Doppler physics how you can uh, use uh, pressure recovery time, but it doesn't offer a whole lot of advantage in terms of the actual assessment of gradient other than the mean gradient, which seems to be more or less what we get when we take these patients to the cath lab. 
The other thing that you can do for the aortic valve is use the continuity equation, assuming that whatever goes in comes out. And if we know the diameter here, and we know the velocity here, and we know the velocity there, then if we put these on a simple formula like this, we can calculate the actual aortic valve area. It seems to work a lot better again in adults than in children because I don't think that the, we are actually looking at the same kind of population of stenosis in adults as we look at in children. And where valve areas seem not to be calculable to the same degree, even if you use a Gorlin formula, and it really doesn't mean anything because uh, a lot of times it's uh, ventricular forces that determine what happens, and these patients don't have aortic valve disease from the time that they're born, they have it substantially before it. And so there's remodeling and abnormalities that begin in fetal life that we present to ourselves in neonatal and, and other life that makes the, the pressure um, 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 uh, generation abilities of the ventricle uh, substantially different. So this is our statistics, 59% uh, left right and 37% uh, right non and 4% the other way around. Okay? What about aortic insufficiency? I mean, we have to consider that uh, in all valves. And there's a study uh, by Lloyd Tarney and uh, Luan Minnick from uh, the, uh, the Pediatric Heart Network Center, the furthest west one in Salt Lake City. And what they found is the most reliable way of calculating the degree of aortic insufficiency was to measure the jet width against the diameter of the aortic outflow, and that if it was over 40%, it was severe. If it was under 20%, it was mild. And obviously, the group in the middle was moderate regurgitation. And the only other thing that worked well for them was retrograde abdominal flow, which is merely another reflection of, uh, of blood pressure. So it worked probably better than blood pressure because it's so hard to see. But uh, retrograde flow um, determined uh, how or the severity of the aortic insufficiency. Pressure half time um, is an adult form looking for it. Uh, it works the, the reverse way of mitral stenosis. The flatter the curve, the less the uh, uh, degree of insufficiency. The steeper the curve, the more in, uh, severe the degree of insufficiency. And again, the numbers are very simple. If it's un over 400, it's mild. If it's under 200 uh, 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 meters per second, uh, it's uh, severe, and the moderate ones are in between. Here's an example of looking at retrograde abdominal flow. In addition to just looking at this on a quantitative basis, you can also integrate the signals. And again, if this is more than 40% of that as a VTI, that means you've got significant aortic insufficiency. And here's just a color symbol, simple color signal showing uh, retrograde flow because the flow in this aorta should be coming down towards you in a red or yellow color, which it does, but in diastole, the blood flow is going back. So a very simple way of looking at the severity of aortic uh, regurgitation. Okay, and you can do that around the arch as well. And I've got the so-called haberdashers approach of mild, moderate, and severe. A little while ago, a study uh, in, uh, from uh, Dallas came out talking about the use of magnetic resonance imaging, you know, that wonderful technique that Dr. Hasbani keeps on talking about, and looking at the relationship of ventricular wall um, uh, hypertrophy to the cavity. And that was work that was started a long time ago by a guy called John Ross who works at the University of California in San Diego, where he talked about an afterload mismatch. So a ventricle should hypertrophy in order to maintain wall stress. And so uh, if that happens, that's a concentric type of hypertrophy. And if the wall doesn't rotate appropriately, of course, the, the, um, the stress on the ventricle is increased. The amount of work and myocardial oxygenation that's needed is increased. And he produced this very beautiful series, or the group produced this very, Khuri is the gentleman's name, yeah, who produced a, a very beautiful series of MRI pictures which allowed you to calculate this and formulated a prognosis based on, on MRI. And so I looked at all of this data and said, well, yes, we can do that on echo. So we've got normal, intermediate, dilated, thick, 
and both uh, on, on these, and we can do that, and we could also uh, use this uh, very unreliable technique of calculating volumes by uh, 2D and uh, get an example of mass volume thickness. And we know that the mass of the ventricle is almost <coughs> always 1.2 times as much as its volume. So if you calculate the volume of the myocardial mass, and this is a, it, it, it holds for any size ventricle, the mass of the ventricle is always more than 1.2 times the, the, the volume of the ventricle. And when you uh, get after load... Yes. The mass of the ventricle, if you calculate ventricular mass by a reliable technique, either M-mode or use our uh, two-dimensional technique, which the ASE recommends, uh, the mass of the ventricle in terms of its grams is greater than the volume of the ventricle in, uh, filled with blood by 1.2 times. Okay? That's called the mass volume ratio. And when that is distorted, then you have all sorts of abnormalities. And this is what you get when you get this afterload mismatch. And it's a really not a favorable sign and, uh, of, uh, okay, Dr. Friedberg's just told me he's going to be talking about this in greater detail. So Dr. Sanders mentioned this uh, infective endocarditis and no, no talk on echocardiography is, uh, is adequate unless we show you a flying goober. And so here are examples of vegetations on the valve by echocardiography. Here's one at the time of surgery. And unfortunately, this little patient had a, a vegetation, but it eroded through his aortic wall and he had a myocardial mass, uh, a, um, 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 a pericardial, a myocardial abscess, pericardial abscess. Aortic root abscess is the word I was looking for. Now, with critical aortic stenosis, especially in the newborn, you see uh, not often just a hypertrophied contracted ventricle, but here an example of this afterload mismatch with poor function, with endocardial fibroelastosis, with dilated pulmonary veins, with the atrial septum bulging uh, into uh, the right atrium, uh, indicating the stress, and here's the doming little aortic valve uh, down below. And we can see that by a number of different uh, views and techniques. Uh, and you see um, um, really the uh, effect of the ventricle uh, from the, this amount of stress. So that's all I have to show you in terms of the echocardiography. And uh, we'll let uh, Dr. Friedberg talk about the next group. The way um, I need to...